we've talked about what k-fold cross-validation is, but we haven't really talked about how to choose k. What is a good value of k to choose? So let's talk about how to choose k for k-fold cross-validation. And so let's think about, so what are we doing? What, 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 what should be our criteria for choosing k? Let's go back up here, back up here to the beginning. We we're thinking about what what is the purpose of cross validation? Well, the purpose is we want to choose. Of course, we want to choose a good model from this set of this this finite model class class of models. And our criteria for choosing a good model was that we wanted it to have low expected loss. We don't have low this low error epsilon m and m with a low epsilon m. And so what, is, so what we did, right, we wanted to have a low epsilon m, and what we did was we constructed this estimator, epsilon hat m. We estimated epsilon m with, this, with the procedure, the, the k-fold cross-validation procedure. And this is, a, this is actually, if we think about the data as being random, we think about the data as being random IID samples, from this true unknown distribution p, then this estimator, this epsilon hat m, is a random variable that depends on the data, since the data is random. And it also depends on, it depends on, of course, our model, like so epsilon m hat would depend on m, of course, the model, and it would depend on the data, and it would depend on k, so, so it would be, so let's write down here, so what is what is this thing? So we wanted to we wanted to estimate this. So we constructed an estimator estimator epsilon hat m, and let's denote the k. Let's put a superscript k. So before I was using this this to denote, denote the er, the sort of error for each round, you know, before. But this is different now. This is k. So the k denotes the k in in the k-fold cross-validation. So it's an estimator of epsilon m. And we've talked before about, you know, how how do you choose how do you choose a good estimator? And if we thought, you know, if we if we wanted to use some how you know what well what is what does it mean to have a good estimator? Well we need to have some loss function, right? We're thinking if we're thinking from a decision theoretic perspective, and we are, then we need to choose a loss function if we're going to evaluate these, if we're going to do it in a principled way. And well, let's choose, well, let's see, so this is, these are continuous valued things, these are real valued things. So let's choose, well, let's just say epsilon hat m. Let's choose the square loss. That's a natural sort of loss function in, in this type of problem. And so, we have we want to min, we want to have we want to choose an estimator that has small expected square loss and that is of course the mean squared error right that's just the definition of the mean squared error and i could i could also put here you know this also depends on the data i could put data depends on the data as a random variable depends on the data well, let's, let's drop that just but just remember that it's a random variable that's a function of the data and the randomness the randomness comes from the data since the data is random so the mean squared error we talked about remember we talked about the bias variance decomposition remember the mean squared error can be decomposed as the bias squared plus the variance that's the bias variance decomposition. And so in order to choose a good value of k for this estimator, we need to find a good trade-off between bias and variance. So in some sense, so this is sort of a this is sort of a very interesting sort of introspective thing, right? Because you know, we need to choose a good value of k, and in some sense each different k is sort of you know, it's it's some it's this parameter, but the whole point of doing this procedure in the first place, the whole point of doing cross validation, was to choose a parameter m 
for, you know, it was sort of the model selection parameter. So in the, in, the, in the process of choosing a model selection parameter, we need to choose a, a parameter for our process for choosing the parameter. So let's think about how, how we're going to choose this. Let's, and, and let's think about in terms of the bias and the variance. What makes sense? Well, when k, let's use a color now. Let's think about what happens when k is large. Like, for example, i.e., when k is n, when k is the, the total number of data, data points. When k was n, that was just, that was leave one out cross validation. And in leave one out cross validation, so let's go back up to our data here. In leave one out cross validation, we took a single point, each, each point, each training, each example in our data set was a fold. So this was the first fold. So we trained on all of this. And then we evaluated on this on the first round. And then we took the second point. We trained on everything else. And then we evaluated on that for the second round. So when k is when k equals n, that's what that's what we're doing. And let's think about is what is the bias low or is the bias high? So let's go down here. Let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this picture here. Is the bias low or is the bias high? Well, when when k equals n, the training set is almost the entire data set. So each of the each of the 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 you know the sort of the, on the the first round or on any of the rounds the the cla the the function that we get the prediction function that we get the classifier or the the regression function that we get is going to look very very similar to the final thing that we get the one that we would get if we train on the whole data set because we're only leaving out one point so each of these is going to be fairly representative of the the whole you know the resulting thing and since we're leaving out one point you know that and that's an that's independent of all the rest then that's going to be a fairly good a fairly good indicator fairly fairly you know low bias in terms of its indication of the error for the final thing so the bias for this is going to be low low bias on the other hand what's happening with the variance so let's think about the variance. This each of since each of these guys, each of these, you know, if we had some sequence, you know, FM1, FM2, each of these each of these prediction functions that we constructed, they're all going to be very similar, right? But they all depend very, very highly on the data. And as a result, the resulting, you know, the, the, this estimate is going to be very, very sensitive. The estimate that we get, this epsilon hat m, the estimate that we get of the error is going to be very sensitive to the particular data set that we get, right? It's not going to be, you know, these are not going to vary a whole lot. I mean, they'll vary depending on the, you know, the error will depend on, you know, each of the points, but the classifiers themselves are going to be fairly similar. And since they're so highly dependent on the de that that particular sample of data that we got, it's going to be fairly high variance. You know, if you wanted to have low variance, you would want to estimate over a very sort of wide range. You'll get a whole bunch of samples of data, data one, data two, all independent. And if you were to average over all of those, then you would get low variance. But this is highly dependent on the very one particular data set that we got. So this has high variance. It's good, fairly high variance. So now what happens when k is relatively small? Let's say, eg, I guess I should put this as eg, not ie, for example. For example, so when k is small, let's say around 5 or so, or, or you know, 3, 4, 5, something. Then what's happening with the bias? Well, maybe we, we think it's going to be high. Let's, let's think about that. So when k is small, well, it's this sort of, sort of, sort of more 
well, well, like this picture. Well, when k was 5, this is, this is the picture. Actually, let's make it even smaller to, in order to be just to really sort of see it clearly. Let's say k equals 2, super small. Then what's going to happen? What's going to happen with the bias? Well, in that case, our training set is only going to be half on each round. Our training set is only going to be half of the data, D. And as a result, the resulting, you know, each of this, the, these functions are going to be probably do much worse than if we trained on the whole data because we're only getting half the data to work with. So as a result, we would expect these to really not do not do very not do as well as if we had trained on the whole data set. So this is going to be biased towards lower or rather this is going to be biased towards higher error. The, the, our estimate of the error is going to be higher because each of these guys is going to be not going to be as good. He just doesn't have as much to work with. So this is going to have higher higher bias and it's also going to have lower variance. So that's for k small. And so in order to find a good trade-off, so people have, I mean, people have done lots of experiments and, and, and also theory about k-fold cross-validation. And at, so the, the, the common wisdom is that a good sort of balance between these two is so we'll, we'll put it here. So we'll say a recommended recommended value of k is k equals 10. This is sort of the maybe the standard sort of choice of k to use. Sometimes people use 5 uh, or 10, but, but k, 5, or 10. 10 is sort of the recommended number. All right, so that, that was kind of interesting, right? That was kind of cool because we were, we were thinking about, you know, it's, it turned out that in order to choose K, this was sort of a complexity. This was sort of a, a complexity parameter, right? Choosing K was a complexity parameter, and we were using it to choose the procedure that we, would, we were going to use to choose the complexity parameter. So there's something sort of very interesting and introspective in there. And, and if you wanted to get really crazy, I mean, this would be totally silly, but you could even imagine doing, you know, k-fold cross-validation to choose k, right? But that would be, I don't think anybody actually does that. But you could, and that would be sort of, that would be sort of interesting. So that's, that's k-fold cross-validation. And I hope that was all, all very clear and interesting to you. And uh, I think k-fold cross-validation is probably probably one of the you know wi most widely used types of model selection. So it's definitely a very very good thing to know how to use and understand understand how it works. And before we so before wrapping up, I want to say one more thing about I want to say one more thing to compare k-fold cross-validation with Bayesian methods. So we talked about Bayesian methods for model selection and we talked about k-fold cross-validation and just one you know one sort of thing to point out is that with k-fold cross-validation we had this restriction that we had to work with finitely many different models in our model class and that can be one advantage of the Bayesian of Bayesian methods is that sometimes Bayesian methods can handle can you know high dimensional sort of continuous valued parameters in a very natural way. So that can be one advantage of Bayesian methods over cross-validation. And so another point of comparison, both methods give you estimates of your error. I mean that's what the point of cross-validation is to estimate the error. And you can also do, you also get the same thing in a Bayesian method. So there, so, but this, I think this, this continuous parameters in high dimensions is one area where you might really want to choose a Bayesian method over cross-validation. Okay, see you later.